Hey, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Whiskey Festival in a Box. Um, it's very, very exciting. We're on to our first proper tasting uh, session um, just now. So this is our Scotch Whiskey 2 session. Um, those of you with your packs you will have noticed that we actually have seven whiskies for this uh, for this um, tasting session. So you guys got a real deal there, I think. Um, a real interesting um, cornucopia of, of different of different whiskies and styles here. Very excited by this, um, including some very new brands and distilleries as well. So it should be a really fascinating tasting. Hopefully, lots of fun as well. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the guys and gals. Um, so here we have them here. Say hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Hi. <laughs> They're all on me at this point. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Emily from uh, um, from Glasgow Distillery, and she's going to introduce the first whiskey. But I'm just going to um, knock the other guys out just for now. See you soon. Now, I think you're on mute. There we go. Can you hear us now? There we go. Sorry. So it's 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 uh, Emily and Elizabeth. Elizabeth. I'm sorry. I didn't catch it earlier because it's quite mm -hmm. a lot of background noise. Um, no. Well, listen. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really excited to hear about what you're up to at um, at Glasgow Distillery. Um, I've got a very big bottle of it here. Uh, <laughs> and this is not the uh, the actual labelled stock, but I'm sure you've got that there, so you can show it to the viewers. Um, I should mention that um, all of the whiskies, well, most of the whiskies that we've got on tasting can be bought from House of Malt, um, our uh, partner retailer. I will be flashing up the um, the cost of the bottles and how to get hold of them and all that kind of thing. Um, but for now, I'm going to let um, um, the, the guys from um, Glasgow talk you through the 1770 original, which I think you'll like very much. So take it away, please. Great, thanks. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Emily and this is my colleague Elizabeth. And uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we're coming from the tasting room in the, in the distillery itself. So we've recently just refurbed this. It used to be um, a fairly sad looking boardroom, um, but now it's quite, we've, we've glammed it up. So I'm gonna quickly just run through a bit about the brand and a bit about us and what we're doing. And then I'll hand over to Elizabeth and we'll get started with some drinking. So we founded, we didn't, the distillery was founded in uh, 2012 um, and the site was, um, well we picked the site in roughly 2014, so the stills didn't actually arrive with us until 2015. We laid down our first casks that year um, and then obviously three years later we started to, to bottle. So it's quite a young whiskey that we're working with. We do have um, three 1770 in the range now. So we've got the original, which we're going to try today. We also have a, a peated and a triple distilled, but we're not going to go into them too much because we could fit them all in the pack. So we're going to stick to the original um, in terms of tasting. Um, so yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I'll hold a pour glass. <laughs> um, just to say a few things about myself. Uh, obviously, my name is Elizabeth. Uh, I actually work in European exports, but I thought I'd pop, a, pop in, tag along, an excuse to have a bit of a, 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 nice, sure. a nice glass of whiskey with Emily in the, in the tasting room. Um, so I'm quite new to the company, really. I joined back in January, and I worked for uh, I worked in the industry for quite a long time, working for lots of different uh, producers. And what really attracted me to Glasgow Distillery is the fact that we are the first distillery in Glasgow, single malt distillery, to open up since well, over 100 years. So um, we really try and you know rejuvenate the whole fantastic culture of making superb single malt whiskies in Glasgow. And I think um, you know, fast forwarding from 2018, I think we've done a pretty spectacular job yeah. in terms of what we have bottles. What I would like to say um, immediately about whiskey is a very honest whiskey. Um, the bottle here, um, all natural colour, no chill filtering, so it's 46% alcohol. And we invest heavily in fantastic equipment and um, also fantastic oak. So uh, our original one has been matured in ex-bourbon casks or first filled bourbon casks and then we have finished 
our whiskey in virgin casks, which is quite unusual. Um, not many distillers are really lucky enough to get their hands on, on virgin oak. And just by finishing our whiskey in virgin oak, we get some fantastic um, sort of wood extractive flavours we tend to get from, um, particularly from American Corpus Alba, which are these kind of soft fruits. And also we get that really quite deep, beautiful, all natural golden colour, as you can see. So, um, so yeah, the colour you can see is absolutely natural and um, leave some pretty nice kind of meandering um, legs um, going down the glass. So straight away you will be able to detect that it's going to have quite a nice long finish. So let's give it a, a wee nose. Yeah, it's one o'clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, obviously we're a lowland single malt, so um, quite known for having quite light um, I hate the phrase girly whiskey. Um, that's not a phrase I would want to hear used by anyone. This is more like a breakfast whiskey, or perhaps you can call it a, an aperitif sun whiskey. Um, but I would say it's a whiskey you can drink all day long, really. Um, it is light, and on the nose, you do get those kind of um, pretty typical American oak type aromas coming through. You know, tropical fruits. Get a wee bit of uh, banana and pineapple. Yeah, the banana for me, mm -hmm. absolutely. We also have um, the most amazing new mix spirit, I have to say, because we distill in very small copper pot stills. Um, obviously, the copper is fantastic for producing a lot of esters. So we get so much of like apples and pears and bananas coming through in our new mix spirits. Uh, it also removes you know, any kind of a, the sulfur notes coming through in the distillation process which carries over from um, fermentation. So I think that comes through really nicely mm -hmm. with, with our original one. This is also, of course, very special for us because it's the first one we released and we were quite different, Emily, when we released it, weren't we? Because mm -hmm. um, they weren't, you know, they weren't just available for anyone to purchase. No, it was quite a, it was quite a, a journey. When we first released the, the 1770, Kind of Glasgow were keen to see what we'd been working on. Obviously, we have a lot of other brands that we'd released in the meantime, but the whiskey was one everyone was waiting for. And we decided what we would we, we kind of invited some of the public into a private tasting of the first cask when we were when we were bottling. Um, and it was actually the people of Glasgow that came to, to visit us in the distillery that night that created the tasting notes that are now displayed on the bottle. So that's quite a nice and special kind of keeping it a bit closer to Glasgow and, and letting them in, enjoy it and join in with us as well. We only released 5,000 bottles of the, the first the first release 1770 and it sold out in less than a week um, on an online ballot. So that was really exciting for us. It just kind of kind of showed us that everyone was behind us and that everyone was as as excited as we are and, and as excited as we were. Yeah, yeah. we were also quite different in the sense that we kind of embrace our community. So we invited, um, you know, uh, the Glaswegians to send in their tasting notes. Uh, and I really love that as a refreshing idea because it is a bit of kind of a pompous side to the whiskey industry, arguably, when you do read some of the tasting notes and it's everything from, you know, fresh leather glove to dandelion. <laughs> um, so, and also, whiskey is such a complex drink. You know, the, the Scottish Whiskey Research Institute, they have concluded that there are 80 different congeners or um, aroma combinations in a, in a typical single malt. Of course, no one can detect all 80, but maybe you can detect one or two or three, and the flavours you do, you know, pick up is also very subjective. But I think what very come what comes through typically with this one is a fruitiness, yeah, and the sweetness, nice. yeah. like a creme brulee, almost a cakey um, kind of uh, taste to it. Mm. It's uh, it's quite it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? It's very spicy as well as as well as the fruitiness, which is obviously coming from the the slightly uh, newer oak or, or the newer oak as well. Yeah. Um, what I'd be interested to know, um, if you if you wouldn't mind, is what how do you see going forward your house style? Because obviously, you know, this is very young whiskey that you're um, putting in a very vociferous cast in order to achieve, you know, a really good result. But obviously, it may not be the the whiskey that it will taste like at, you know, eight, ten years old. So I assume you're going to kind of uh, dial back on the on the more uh, fresh oak. 
Um, yes, I mean, in our core range, we have used a variety of cask finishes. We have our peated one, which I've finished off in Olorosa casks. And uh, we are now about to bottle uh, a new batch of pieces, which have been maturing in PX casks. So pretty tremendous. Uh, so we are experimenting a lot more with different cask finishes. But I think, you know, the virgin oak is a fantastic combination with quite young spirits. Um, and, you know, when we're drinking this, arguably, you would not think that this is actually just a three year and a bit old whiskey because it has so much fantastic complexity to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you certainly wouldn't think that it was only three years and a bit, as you say. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very well put together and, um, yeah, very nice indeed. Well done. Well, thanks. Thank well, I think, I think also something that every producer will be keen on is you don't want, you, you know, you want the kind of uh, glass with the DNA, the new mix spirit, those typical extremely fruity flavours to be there, like, like in, in the base. But then you just enhance that with the, the right amount of spiciness from the oak. So you always really try and find a balance between, um, obviously, when we're using cherry cask, we don't want to create like a sherry bomb, but it works mm -hmm. fantastically for a peated spirit. So it's all always about finding that right balance between having the right influence from the oak, but never losing, you know, that typical distillery character, which yeah. is um, pretty tremendous. Yeah. Well, I think I think what you are and what um, many of the new producers in Scotland and, and here in England and elsewhere as well, uh, you, you're, you're doing a fantastic job of showing what can be done with young spirit. Because I think the perception in the past was always, oh, it's not 10 years old, you can't drink that yet. Oh, it's not 15 years old or whatever. And I think that um, you, know, you guys uh, are among those that are showing all of us that actually, you know, it doesn't have to be a 10 year old or, or older, you know, you can drink whiskey at a younger age and it still tastes pretty damn good. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've tasted quite a number of whiskies, you know, gone, you know, the, the old whiskies and it's a bit like drinking a pencil. If you, if you mature whiskey too long, you know, it's always, it's always, I think, exciting to find young, kind of vibrant whiskey, which tastes really good um, and also offer something different. Yeah, as, as opposed to the well-established whiskey brands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, Emily and Elizabeth, that was tremendous. Thank you. I hope you'll stick around because we'll we'll do a little bit um, Q and A at the very end. But thank you for for introducing the first whiskey for Slander Bar. I'm going to now bring in um, uh, Erin. Uh, I'm going to let you guys go for now. Uh, now we're there we are. Aaron, how are you doing, man? Hey, Eddie, how are you? You keeping well? I am. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better and better as the day goes on. <laughs> <laughs> warmer and warmer. I brought, a, I brought a cushion today because my back's a bit sore from my efforts in the week, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, Good. Now, you're, you're presenting, obviously, this, uh, the Glasgow was, is a new distillery, what you're presenting is a, is a completely new brand but from an old distilling company and blending company. So um, I think everyone is going to be very interested to hear all about it. So I will, uh, I will let you get on with it and then I will ask you some questions afterwards. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm different to everybody else here. I mean, it's a fantastic lineup. I've got to be honest from a personal perspective, this is probably one of the more exciting boxes that we have available here because it's all about innovation inside whiskey and um, how flavors and profiles will change and new, new uh, distributors, new brands, new distilleries pop up and release new expressions. Um, this for me is more interesting than, let's say, a uh, tasting where you go through your classics, uh, you know, your 12s, your 15s, your 18s, because here we're trying something new that's never been tried before. Uh, so Whiskey Works is um, it's an independent arm of White and Mackay. So as, as I was pointing out, it's an established firm so since 1844. We've got eight, White and Mackay has been uh, producing whiskey. Whiskey Works uh, is the brainchild of a, one of our whiskey makers called Greg Glass. Uh, and it's very much an approach of uh, like a skunk work. So whereas um, AMG is part of Mercedes, Abarth is part of Fiat, um, Shelby is our own skunk works, our own right. This is very much the kind of, approach we're going with the whiskey works where everything is an experiment and everything is to 
test what we can do and how, what kind of flavor we can bring out from the whiskey. We're not looking for creating a collectible whiskey. We're not looking for creating a, a whiskey which has to have a particular age statement on it. Everything is flavor led and everything is as honest as it can possibly be. Um, Greg has always been a proponent of being very transparent with people who are whiskey drinkers. As Again, I think as Elizabeth was saying that sometimes whiskey can be seen as being a bit um, pompous uh, and Greg really wants to kind of cut through all of that and just really kind of speak to the consumer about what's inside the bottle is honest, honest to God whiskey that's got a wicked flavor flavor to, to it. So King of Trees, um, although we have four whiskeys in the range, King of Trees is one of my favorites, uh, partly because of the story that goes with it, but I think it really kind of embodies the, what we're trying to do at uh, Whiskey Works. So uh, King of Trees has actually been finished off in um, Scottish Oak. So Scottish Oak is, um, it's well known for, for being quite burning, quite knotty. It's very difficult to work with in comparison to American oak, which traditionally grows lovely, very tight grained and really nice and tall. So you get a really nice, easy to work with malleable material. Scottish oak is very difficult because of the fact that it's so windy. There's lots of burrs and knots, etc. So it's not a material that's often used in the whiskey industry. But seeing as whiskey comes from Scotland, it seems daft that we don't use the natural resources that are on our doorstep. Um, with the King of Trees, we really tried to see the kind of profiles we could get from Scottish Oak. And this comes actually from two windfowls uh, trees, which were then air dried naturally over a process of a couple of years. Uh, and it only yielded a couple of casks because it is quite difficult. And part of that, we, we um, had to come up with new techniques. So working with the sawmills, working with the cooperages to try and find a new way and create almost an apprenticeship program to work with this material, which is almost forgotten. Um, and I've got some in the glass here. One of the things I really I think it's fantastic for tasting whiskeys. Just get a little dip on your finger. And then if you just rub it into your hands like this and get a big old sniff, first thing I get from this is just this incredible kind of green orchard fruit with um, just apple pie. To me, it's just pastry, creme brulee. It's quite sweet. It's quite creamy, butterscotch. And um, where there's originals, that kind of thing, all those kind of lovely flavors that you remember from when you were a child. Um, and, and that's that's such a, a, a difference to, uh, it's not what you would expect from Scottish Oak, it's about to be quite spicy, quite rich, quite heavy, but the fruit that comes through is phenomenal. Uh, as Eddie was saying, we are an independent arm of white McBan, as a part of that, what we're doing is making sure that the stock that goes into our whiskies doesn't actually come from our own portfolio. So White Mackay's portfolio are, you know, Jura, Feta Ken, and the Dalmore. Uh, what we're doing here with Whiskey Works is we're using stock from other distillers, other producers, which we are then able to play around with. And that approach allows us to think laterally in terms of in terms of what whiskey we can produce. Because obviously, if you're working with a product that you know, like the back of your hand, you'll always go down a particular path. Whereas by choosing choosing whiskies from other producers, here what we're doing is experimenting what can we can do to bring out certain flavor profiles and what we can do to bring out these kind of um, different expressions that are very much are flavor led. Um, and what I think is absolutely fantastic about the bottle itself is on here, we're trying to be as, as honest as we can with our bottlings as well. So it's all natural color, non sure filtered. This is bottled at 46 and a half percent. And then as I said earlier on, we're not looking to create a collectible whiskey. However, they are genuine small batch. When I say genuine small batch, this is one of only 2000 bottles, just over 2000 bottles. The idea here being that it's an experiment. We get to play around with it. If it works, then perhaps we might look at doing a re-release in the future. If it doesn't, that's absolutely fine. We'll move on and do something different. And part of our range, we, we are trying to play around with um, some older older whiskies in stock. Uh, so we have some 20-year-old Speyside whiskey and 29-year-old grain whiskey, both from extinct distilleries. Uh, but we're trying to treat them with care and really just bring out those extra profiles and breathe a bit of extra youth back into them. But with the younger expressions is where we really get to kind of flex our muscle and, and try and bring out these new flavor profiles. And for me, I think this is an absolutely delicious whiskey. It's, you could almost pour it on your porridge and claim it's one of your five a day. It's so fruity, just fresh cream apple, pears. Again, like I say, a bit of that pastry note. I'm just gonna have a little bit of a, a nose of it myself because it is, it is very, very, very yummy. So you get this really kind of lovely round flavor. It's still very fresh, lots of acidity in there. But just as it comes back at the end, when you think the alcohol is going to come over and overpower, you get this lovely kind of, like I say, that butterscotch where the original note comes back and just kind of rounds out the whole flavor. Still really fresh, delicious. My mouth is watering since I'm drinking it now. I mean, I could drink that quite happily for the rest of the day, to be totally truthful with you. Um, and I think that this is a, a very genuine and honest whiskey. And I think that part of what we're doing is actually quite lovely. Greg's... Um, Grace philosophy is, is again going down the sustainable route, which is what the industry needs to do as a future. So for every tree that we use, 
from now on we're planting three trees in this place and that's not just for us to use and it's not just for our, our future children to use it's for our future generations to use a whiskey makers you know 50 60 70 100 years or so so it's something that we really believe in as part of our ethos as part of whiskey works and so i think it's great that greg's been able to um kind of be given the keys to the kingdom effectively and have all that infrastructure and support from white and Mackay to be able to create this modern brand that's brilliant thanks for that um aaron no problem um i i did um, I did a little sneak peek of all of the whiskies just before the tasting because I was uh, well I was <laughs> and, <why wouldn't> you? <laughs> and I thoroughly enjoyed all of them and they all have their own kind of um, foibles if you can hear any background noise it's because there's a socially distant tour happening behind so sorry about that um, but the thing that strikes me about King of Trees is that real fresh fruitiness it's a real um, refreshing whiskey if that Absolutely. makes sense yeah i mean like like i say so uh, we have four whiskies in the range and every for every release we do a, a modern expression where we get to play around with new flavors and then a more classic expression where we let the whiskey kind of sing for itself and just try and enhance the flavors um i like all of them but my personal favorite is king of trees and seeing as i was the one giving the talk today i thought this would be the one i'd, I'd uh, choose it's it's exactly that i it's very rare that I've been able to taste the whiskey and genuinely say that you can get this incredible fresh, punchy green fruit come through. Normally you get things like, you know, stewed bananas, ripe, ripe apricots, uh, stewed fruits, peaches, that sort of thing. It's, it's very rare that you find something that's just so fresh and so clean as well. And like I say, when you drink it, your mouth actually waters because it's just so, so rich. I can definitely attest to that, uh, Aaron. Yeah, it's definitely um, another another breakfast dram, isn't it? It's just a really hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, you can pour it on your cornflakes and claim it as one of your five a day. Exactly. Did you mention, Erin, the number of distillers distilleries that went into that at all? Or yeah. Uh, so the recipe's kept sort of secret, really. Uh, Greg um, keeps it very close to the chest. I I do know um, some distilleries have gone into some of the older products, um, but the younger stuff, Greg really wants it bought on the merit of the whiskey in the bottle rather than on the history so he doesn't want people to go and, and buy a whiskey works because it has a particular distillery inside of it he wants people to buy whiskey works and the whiskey inside it itself speaks for the quality yeah i mean i would totally agree with you i think that with blended malt it's quite challenging because obviously you have people interested in whiskey who are genuinely interested in knowing what what the makeup is but mm -hmm. like I say, some people get turned on or off by certain distillery names. Um, but as we were talking, we had a, a, a brave, an 18 year old brave on last night on the tasting, and it was just stunning. But even some of the presenters hadn't tried, um, you know, Braves of Glenlivet or Brave or whatever you want to call it, and absolutely loved it. But, you know, these little gems which I'm sure feature in things like King of Trees and, and certainly, you know, the likes of I do know that um, Greg does have access to some quite nice stocks. I, because I do know some of the distilleries that have gone into some of it are genuine gems. But again, it, it, I think it's a testament to um, Greg's version of trying to present whiskey in the sense that it cuts through all of that kind of red tape and that kind of preconception of it will taste like this or like that. He, everything is all about the flavour, and the flavour is is king basically for, for him. I mean, for one of our whiskies, for example, I think there is a. 0.5% of, of an 11 year old in there. So therefore it now has to be called an 11 year old. Other than that, it would have been known as a, an 18 year old malt, but that 0.5% for him just adds a bit of flavor that gives it an extra something that you wouldn't necessarily have. So for him, you know, like for most people, age is just a number really. It's, it's all about what's inside. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I think, you know, blended malt itself is starting to gain some real traction. And I think, people are starting to understand a little bit more that blended malt doesn't necessarily mean blended scotch. Um, yeah. and even, even if it did, you know, there are some incredible blended scotch whiskies um, out there as well. And I think, you know, part of our job, part of your job as well is to, is to try and get people to just accept uh, whiskey. Good whiskey yeah. is good whiskey. It doesn't matter what it, you know, the category it's in. If it tastes good, it's good. And it's good, absolutely. And what's good for you might not necessarily be good for me, and vice versa. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. Anyway, listen, that was that was wonderful. Thanks for um, introducing us to that, Erin. I'm sure there's lots of people who've not had the chance to try uh, King of Trees before, but I'm sure they will be trying it again. Um, Absolute pleasure. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to take you out of the feed, and I'm going to bring in our next presenter, who is Mariella. Just oh, nearly remove myself there. Go, Mariella. Oh, Hello. sorry, I I, un I unmuted you and then you muted yourself. Or <laughs> I did <laughs> because I thought I was supposed to do uh, that, and then obviously I wasn't. So, <laughs> but yeah, hi. Uh, now, how how are you, my old friend? Well, you're not I'm old, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm very good, thank you. And how are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I've got seven beautiful whiskies in front of me and a spittoon, so I'm all, I'm all good to go. You're fine. You're fine for yeah. the day. It was a beautiful location, by the way. I absolutely love the stills in the background and that cask. It's great. Yeah, I perhaps didn't mention. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, but I'm, I'm kind of taking it for granted now that we're <laughs> here at the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery in um, Filey, just outside Scarborough. That's uh, great. Which and you know they were very kind to let us come and host the the event here, which is still an hour's journey from from where I live. But uh, you know, it's. I where, thought you were a small there. city, but apparently it's not that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, cool. Anyway, listen, we're we're not here right now to talk about me and Spirit of oh. Yorkshire. Oh, We've got oh that's time to get. Fair enough. We're, <laughs> we're here to talk about um, Aaron and um, particularly the quarter cask. So I'll, I'll give you the floor, so to speak, and then we can have a chat afterwards, okay? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity as well. Uh, I hope um, all of you that are following are having a, a nice uh, time with a, you got a lot of very nice drums. I've been drumming along as well and listening to the other presenters, which is very cool. Thank you, Whiskey Lounge, for sending a box, which is very appreciated. Don't think that just because we work in the whiskey industry, we don't want to try other people's whiskeys as well. So it was a very nice treat. Thanks. So, um, yeah, I love Iron Distillers and Locranza Distillery. So very happy that today we get to try my favorite of the range. Uh, obviously, I got to choose the whiskey for this event, so I chose my favorite because, you know, why not? Uh, it's the, the one that I feel more passionate and more connected to, so it's great that we can share it. Just to say a few things about the company and our distillery. Um, the company itself uh, is uh, one of the things that we just shout uh, from the rooftop all the time is that we're actually an independent company, and I know uh, some people can take it for granted, but, you know, in a in an industry where more and more distilleries, you know, are owned by big, big companies, it's just nice to have an independent, you know, take on it. Especially when you consider our um, distillery as well, which is only 25 years old. And I say only uh, because, again, you need to put everything into the context. And it's amazing that we get to, you know, I get to talk and taste whiskies that are, you know, 20, 21, and now very soon 25 year old as well. But it is also amazing that uh, our distillery in Locranza um, kind of like, you know, survived and matured in all this journey. So I love our distillers were funded in 1995 by uh, a man, the founder, Harold Curry, which we kind of call a pioneer because if you consider it, um, what was happening in the industry back then, there weren't, you know, that many distilleries popping up. Uh, constantly as they are now so maybe we went through some rough times but still today we can celebrate our 25th anniversary i have an amazing range that has just been rebranded of very good quality whiskey and we can still get to be ourselves and treat the whiskey the way we want and that's the joy of being an independent working for an independent company so we don't chill filter our whiskeys we don't color our whiskeys we bottle at 46 percent or higher and we also have the chance to be very experimental so uh, if you look at the range you see a lot of different products and they every product has its own story which is quite fascinating so you find the iron mold character in all of them but all of them are kind of different so i like it because it's pretty it's very much fun when i do like a tasting with five six whiskies there's always you know a lot of different groups that are attached to a lot of different products so uh it's always fascinating to see what people uh you know taste and uh, favoritism goes towards um 
it is uh, the style of whiskey that we're trying to create really up in Locranza is a unique to ourselves. We want to be, we're a kind of honest, um, clear, transparent, you know, company. We are independent. We just say, you know, we don't have any secrets. We try to be as open as possible to all our customers. And we try to create a whiskey that is true to the place. Also because Ireland is very different as an island compared to the other islands in Scotland. It actually is called, called Scotland in miniature because you have all the landscapes that Ireland, that Scotland can offer in one tiny little place. I was pretty shocked when I went the first time uh, as my idea of Scottish islands were mostly Isla because it's the only place that I've been before that. And then when you actually get to the island and start driving around, you realize how different it is. You can go hike a mountain, you can go down a beach. Uh, the microclimate is different because we're kind of sheltered between Kintyre and Air. There's a cold stream that comes from the south. You have snow in the mountains in the northern part and then tropical flowers in the southern part. It is I call it like a little magical place, you know, with stags and deer and red squirrels roaming around. It's very beautiful. And to me, it's like a fantasy world. So it is. Um, it was the aim since the beginning to create something that was very unique, you know, to the place. We just wanted to be iron whiskey and not, you know, being compared to the rest of the islands or especially with Isla so close by. We didn't want it to be like, you know, uh, the put next to whiskies that are a complete different characters from our. So the way I like to describe Locranza Distillery, our malt character is a space side, but that comes from an island. So at the moment, we're not using any peated stock. So the whiskey that you're gonna drink now is 100% unpeated. We actually just opened the second distillery still on iron in 2019 last year down at Lag, which is only focusing on heavily peated whiskey. So they have two completely different styles of whiskey. But up in Locrans is 100% unpeated, is a very fruity four or dram, a longer fermentation and a very slow distillation allow us to create a spirit which is very um, enjoyable, a very fruity, uh, with a nice interesting texture that goes, you know, from waxy to oily, but a very nice creamy sweet floral dram, that's how I call it, that obviously changes, you know, due to age or different cask maturation, uh, but that overall has, you know, its own character. So the fruitiness of a space side, but still a nice, interesting character and texture, you know, that the island has to offer. The quarter cask, as I said, is my absolute favorite just because I am a sucker for bourbon cask matured whiskeys, and this is like the extreme. Uh, so I like to call it uh, the iron 10 year old, but like on acid or like on drugs, because you have all of the iron mold characters, you know, you have the orchard fruits, you have the sweet vanilla, you have the citrus fruits, a little bit of spiciness, but they're all super enhanced. And the way we achieve that is by, first of all, maturing the whiskey for seven years, around seven years in first fill bourbon cask, very fresh bourbon cask. I don't know if you're like me, when you go to distilleries, you kind of want to, you know, touch, taste and, you know, smell everything. I don't know if you ever smelled, uh, if you ever smelled the empty bourbon cask. I always do that on a Tuesday morning in Locranza. It literally tastes like, smells like banana juice. So when I try to cut a cask, I get a lot of banana juice. And then around only spends seven years in the first fill bourbon cask. We also move it um, to quarter casks that are specially made for us uh, that are made of 125 liters. The staves of these quarter casks are also first fill bourbon. So you have like, you know, a double first, first fill bourbon maturation. Obviously these casks are much smaller. So maturation will be much more intense. You extract much more flavor. You do lose, you know, liquid and alcohol, but you gain a much more intense, you know, flavor profile. We decide to bottle the whiskey then at cast strength. Uh, so, it is, it, it ticks all the boxes for me. Heavy bourbon cast maturation, beautiful whiskey, uncolored, unfiltered, bottle at cast strength. It is just nice, jammy, and intense. All of those orchard fruits and that sweet fruitiness have turned into like tropical fruits, like mango and coconut and pineapple and banana. The spiciness is much more enhanced. So I get a lot of um, like red chili or black pepper, like freshly crushed. It's also very zesty. You get a lot of lemon peel and lime peel. It's almost like a Caribbean trip for me. Like when I drink this, I dream that, you know, I'm out on the beach, you know, drinking this. There's a piña colada in one hand and the quarter cask in the other hand, palm trees, you know, sunshine. Trust me, when you live in Scotland, it's a beautiful way to travel <laughs> just by tasting a whiskey. So I absolutely adore this. Uh, the ABV is a little bit high. I do recommend, I have some beautiful lark fire water over here. Uh, I do recommend dropping a little bit of water 
uh, just because I think it calms it down and it lets the whiskey open up much more. Or if you're patient like me, uh, I recommend you pouring the whiskey and then slowly sipping it throughout like a longer period of time. I actually much prefer a slow oxidization, you know, a loss of alcohol through the glass than a fast, you know, water interference. But then again, this is personal. You drink the whiskey the way you want to drink. I drink the whiskey I want to drink. But uh, overall, I think you agree with me that it's a beautiful, nice, intense and aromatic, juicy dram. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yes to everything I said. Sorry. Did you did you agree to everything <laughs> yeah, just, I said? Just, just yeah. <laughs> well. I, I was fortunate enough to come and see you on Aaron, I think about 18 months ago now, wasn't it? Back in God, February 2019, I think. And um, it, it was my first time. It was Aaron, one of my very first times on Aaron, was... too. And I don't know if you remember, I lost my car keys. I didn't know which, which one, if we were taking the right road or the wrong road. I was completely confused. So. <laughs> So please come back another time. Now that I'm much more familiar <laughs> of the island, so that I can have a, you can have a better experience you, now. <laughs> listen, you more than made up for it by plying us with lots of great whiskey, and uh, and the chat as always was 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 hilarious. So They're always don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but I just want to. I'm just going to take you back to the 1990s, where I possibly weren't even born. I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 I, I remember when Aaron first hit the shelves of uh, Oddbins when I, I used to work there, and I remember thinking, "Oh, that's this is interesting—a a, a new Scottish distillery," which I think you mentioned earlier on at the time was almost unheard of. You know, nobody built an, a new Scottish whiskey distillery. We've already got the establishment. We don't, you know, we don't need more, do we? Um, so it was really fascinating to see it and tasting it. You know. It was it was it was really good. I mean, it wasn't the finished product at that point, but it was very good, and you could see the potential in it. And it's just wonderful to see it maturing over the ages, and and seeing, you know, with a bit of love, application, patience, you know, what what was new has now become a nicely established single malt whiskey. I agree. I always say that I am uh, super lucky to have joined, like, you know, at this, like, you know, switch um, because, you know, I, I joined the company and then the rebranding was happening and lag was opening and, you know, th there was a lot happening. There's still a lot happening, you know, in the company. And then this year is our 25th anniversary. So the 25 year old, you know, comes and it's all very exciting. But what I love the most is to see the community like you know whiskey friends and whiskey you know lovers that this distillery has created just because there are some people that as you said they've been following us since 1995 right so i joined late to the party but you know i'm still i'm enjoying it as much as everyone else but it's just wonderful to see people that were there in 95 you know like the story oh my dad was there he got us you know some founders reserve uh, at the time it was only three year old whiskey and look at you now you know there's a 25 on the market so it's a very different story from you know distilleries that have been producing whiskey since you know the 19th century or some or like 18th century some of them so it's a very very different story and it's, it's just nice to tell people just to put it into context as i said before in the 90s no one was opening distilleries i remember yesterday paul from uh, space said the distillery was funded in the 90, 1990 but then it took them a long time to release a core range well we started you know very fast, very soon we were small, we we're independent, you know, only one man, uh, you know, dragging the whole thing up because it was his dream. And then, you know, if look at us now, maybe we don't, you know, don't have as many tasks as we hoped we, you know, we did, but still like, you know, we still can produce a very nice range of uh, very, you know, beautiful whiskeys, lots of different age statements, lots of different cask varieties. So it's just very exciting time. It is a very exciting time. and. You know, not not being satisfied with one distillery, you guys have opened a new. <laughs> yeah, that you you should come and see it properly now. <laughs> you only saw it from afar last year. <laughs> that was one of now my it's favorite. Like moments. Floor, we have a roof, and we serve food and alcohol. It's amazing. Um, wow. 
It is a beautiful, beautiful, brand new distillery, completely different from La Carranza, very modern uh, looking. And it's also just 100% heavily peated uh, malt that is being used at the moment. So it's 50 ppm only, um, a bit of like, you know, 75 hour fermentation, a bit of a faster distillation. So we're creating this spirit um, which to me reminds me a lot of like a very nice, good aged mezcal. I've only tried the one year old where maybe like a few weeks ago, but it's super exciting. Like uh, I, as you know, I've been working for, you know, peated uh, whiskey uh, bottlers before and I missed, you know, the little bit of smokiness in my life. So I'm so glad that we are opening, you know, that we have lag now to play around with. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, great. it's a nice journey. And also, again, consider how lucky I am to see a distillery literally being built from scratch and then follow it, you know, throughout the years. So it's amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a great time to be alive as a whiskey drinker. <laughs> it is. You know, the sheer number of you know, new distilleries um being opened all over the world not just in scotland but you know all over the world and um be interesting to see actually how how that influences the the old guard as well and maybe maybe ronnie can can comment on that um true yeah uh, not not calling you old ronnie sorry that's not what I meant. <laughs> he's in the backstage you can't say you can't complain that's okay <laughs> um but anyway um, Maria, that was that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Always a pleasure to hear you talk about whiskey um, because I know how much you love it, and um, yeah, we love you for it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna remove you from the stream for now if you don't mind, and I'm gonna bring sure. in the, the legend that is uh, Ronnie Cox. Ronnie, are you? Are I'm you on. Am I on? Good. <laughs> All right. Greetings. I mean, one of the great disadvantages of using this medium is, of course, that uh, you can cut me out and you can't see my reaction when you insult me. <laughs> I, 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 would um, never, I would never deign to insult the legend that is Ronnie Cox. Uh, I, I uh, the legend that is Eddie. I, <laughs> I, um, I've kind of taken a back seat nowadays, but it, to me, it's just so lovely to see the enthusiasm of so many um, that we, so many of the great presenters we've had this morning. And you get an old fart like myself coming into uh, in, into this medium and just having a ball, actually, because I find we can reach a whole lot more possibly than I did before. And without the added complication of jet lag, um, which is just magic. Yes. Uh, the only issue, of course, is that you need to have samples in front of you. And Eddie, you've done a marvelous job in getting the samples out. Um, and thank you for my box, which arrived uh, as you know earlier this morning you're, you're um, i'm sitting up. i'm sitting in a room which uh, displays uh, a picture which is is a reasonably famous picture actually of an illicit distill illicit distiller distiller um back in the sort of 1790s which is when i can trace my family back to their first ever uh, time of distilling in 1816 uh, one of my ancestors was caught twice in one year for distilling and then fermenting um and then selling whiskey, and he was fined 200 pounds and 300 pounds, probably the equivalent of about 40,000, 50,000 pounds today. Um, but I am descended from that side on my mother's, mother's, uh, from my mother's family. Uh, and I got into the whiskey business a long time ago, Eddie, as you know, and you and I have known each other over many years. And what, what is really interesting is to see the, the people in the industry today um, talking about whiskies as if they've been around forever. Of course, you know, single bolts when I joined was less than 1% of the total category. 99% uh, was blended whiskies. And those are the ones that were sold really on the sizzle, not on the steak. And what we're talking about today is about the steak. So everybody's hugely enthusiastic about their products, which I love. Uh, and I, I always like to say to people that, you know, if you're first of all coming into the world of whiskey, it can be quite daunting because everybody has so many different expressions from one particular distillery. And one of the difficulties in single malt um, appreciation is, is actually getting to know the character of a distillery. Uh, and it needs a huge amount of practice. At least that's what I tell my wife. Um, so you've got to try lots of, of different single malts before you get an understanding of A, what you like, but B, 
the personalities of each distillery. This particular distillery, Glenrothes, is a brand which uh, Berry Brothers and Rudd actually developed because the distillery itself uh, was is is a bit is a larger distillery. It's in the town of Rothis, which is exactly halfway between Inverness and Aberdeen. Um, so right in the in the Speyside area, it was always uh, a distillery loved by the uh, blenders uh, because it has a certain uh, enhancing values to it. And if you ask. Still today, most of the master blenders will always put um, in the top 10 this wonderful Glenrothes distillery. It belongs to the Edrington Group, with the owners of Macallan and Highland Park, and uh, uses a very similar sort of wood policy. Uh, it's a slightly lighter style than Macallan, which tends to be, have a, a sort of lovely oily style. Um, and if you were to take three, you know, great distilleries, I suppose, in, in Speyside and, and just exemplify the differences in terms of texture, you would probably take something like Glenlivet as being a, a lighter aromatic style. Um, and, and Macallan is a sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, if you like. And, and then right in, in the middle, you have wonderful brands um, today, such as, as, as Glenrothes and, and, and I would suggest uh, Balvini is another, another great distillery. Um, but today we're talking about um, the uh, Whiskey Makers Cut. And our friend Gordon Motion, the master whiskey maker at Edrington, uh, was, I think, for about 15 or 20 years under... Uh, or he was a protege, really, of um, the previous incumbent, uh, uh, the master blender uh, at, uh, uh, at Eddington. And after he then took the reins, uh, he and I worked together quite closely on the development of Rothis, because what was really important at the time, we actually owned the brand Glen Rothis, but they owned the distillery. It was a very unusual relationship, which goes back in history a quite a long time, but all to do with the supply of whiskey for Katisak, um, the famous blended whiskey which we owned, Berry Brothers and Rudd. Um, and and what we worked on was was to try and enhance the the great characteristics of of Glenrothes, make sure that the personality was allowed to shine through. Uh, uh, too many, in my view, too too many malts and now sort of cask led rather than being spirit led, and and it was largely to do with the fact that everybody really wanted to fast forward and, and to maximize the amount of whiskey you get out of a um, uh, you, you get out of a ton of malted barley. Um, I think today people are now recognizing that actually you can go back to spirit and you can make really good spirit. You don't have to try and enhance the spirit with wood, but you can actually nurture the spirit with wood. And there's a big difference. So that you then allow the personality, and a lot of people are talking about transparency today, but transparency is very important, I think, and being honest uh, with your brand and being unchill filtered if you can possibly do that and being unnaturally colored if you can possibly do that. Um, it, it is about choosing the right sort of casks and as a company like Edrington, of course, has the ability and the know-how and the experience to I think they, I think they today import more than ninety percent of all the sherry casks in the Scotch new sherry casks in the Scotch whisky business. Um, so they have a really good understanding of sherry cask business. And this whisky makers cut is part of the Solio range of whiskies, which are all about sherry and the influence of sherry on on Glenrothes. Um, now, with my experience, you can get a fresh. Uh, sherry cask with, with, with Spanish oak uh, and it can completely dominate the liquid and that's not what you want. You want to have something which is going to just bring out the personality as I say of the distillery make sure it's recognizable and it's not just a sherry bomb because anybody can make a sherry bomb if you've got the right sherry cask but you've got to allow the balance to go to grow well and I always consider cast to be like an education you know you, it's the university basically of, of their lives and you put them into good cast and you're probably going to get a great spirit coming out of it if you put them into mediocre um, uh, uh, casks then you, you're not going to get a great product at the end of it so it, a lot of it's to do with experience so this one as you can see is completely natural colors it's a lovely dark color and 
I would, um, this is the sort of thing that if you know that it's naturally colored and unfortunately, um, unless you put it on the label, how on earth are you going to know that it's, it's naturally colored and not artificially colored? Because people uh, recognize that you can add coloring and it was added to blends when I first joined the blended whiskey market. Of course, it was added just to provide a consistency in terms of color between one bottle and another. Any variation in those days would make would make people think that they've changed the blend. So it was very important to keep the, the maintain the color and thus um, the, um, the, the caramel coloring um, is added. It, only if you go to Germany and see your favorite product, um, will you be able to establish whether or not it's got caramel coloring because in Germany it is, uh, it's uh, illegal not to, not to put that on the, on, the, on the back of the label. So mit Farbstoff or Zuckerkolor. So, um, 10 minutes is very little time to know this, this beauty. But, you know, the other two, the other three whiskies, really, we've, we've been nosing. The first two, I think you have somebody suggested breakfast whiskey is not something that I recommend. But I, I would say definitely in, in terms of categorizing whiskies for people coming into the whiskey market for the first time, um, just think of um, things that are uplifting, um, conversation or relaxational. So those three sort of um, sectors uh, are, are relatively easy. You can categorize them then in your own mind. And then you can become much more um, you know, specific about things uh, later on. But you know, the, the first two were very much what I would call uplifting styles, very good uplifting styles of, of whiskey. Uh, then you get to Aaron and, and the lovely Gordon Mitchell who, who produced that possibly. Um, who I first traveled with, went into Switzerland. I think it was the very first time he'd ever been to Switzerland in his, in his life or even Europe. Um, and uh, we had a lovely conversation, but he produced something there now, which we, we it's a lovely, lovely whiskey, um, very much a, a, a sort of what I call a conversational style. So you can, you can, you know, very happily sit down and have a wonderful long conversation. This one here, the Whiskey Maker's Cut, is very much a, um, a, a relaxing style. Um, it's it's full, it's round, um, it's beautifully put together. And what we're looking for um, with Glen Roth is, I'm, and, and I'm sure Gordon has continued what Berry Brothers and Rudd was doing, which is to make sure there's a balance and a complexity there um, so that you can sniff it and get something else and then something else and something else. It's a very complex whiskey anyway, Glen Roth is, but if you add the other dimension of, of good wood policy and then cast selection on top of that, then you're going to get something which is truly special. This is at 48.8% alcohol, and to me, this is just absolutely perfect. I think it's very difficult. If you were to get, take one Glen Rothis um, in your life and have it on your bar, and I, let's face it, people have a whole huge array of, of single malts nowadays, um, I would certainly suggest you take the Whiskey Maker's Cut. It's not too pricey at 40, just under 50 pounds, I think. Um, and it's one of those absolute classics, which, which defends the, the personality of the distillery, um, but at the same time delivers something much more complex than perhaps you get on the nose. And it is very fulfilling and Moorish. So long in the, long in the palate too, lovely long lasting. So if I just, just sip it. complex, great delivery, rounded. I think elegance is the word that I always attach to Glen Rothis. It's a sister distillery to Macallan, of course. Um, and as such, um, Glen Rothis has always drawn wood from the same sort of suppliers in Southern Spain and also in the United States of America. But I would suggest that, uh, we, that quite a lot of second fill um, sherry casks are used here because first fill, especially if they're European wood, tend to dominate this lovely sort of creamy um, spirit of, of Glenrothes. It's very much an, an underrated dram, Glenrothes. It's, it's not one that has huge amounts of advertising spent behind it, and it's one that um, it's, it's grown very considerably over the last 20 years, but it's largely because people really love the intrinsic values, i.e. The, 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 the flavors of, of the whiskey. Um, rather than the extrinsic values being the imagery surrounding it. Ronnie, I could uh, listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably put me on in the background if you're suffering from insomnia. 
<laughs> it's just, just, it's just wonderful to hear your voice <laughs> and to see you, to see you too. Um, yes, I would totally agree. The, the 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 different styles that we've tasted so far, and this being on that kind of chewier, chocolatey spectrum, you know, very um, not overly sherry, like you say, but it's just got that lovely uh, that, yeah, textural vibe about it that you were mentioning. Pencil sharpening is uh, on the back and sweet syrupy and long. It's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think it's slightly, yes, absolutely. I mean, Gordon Motion is a man who, who uh, he was not only done, uh, Glenn Roth is obviously and, and, and famous grouse and various other bits and pieces, but he's, he's a man who, who understands Glenn Roth is and the facility itself is, is one that I think he finds a little bit uh, on occasions, a little bit frustrating because uh, there's no doubt about it that the spirit does take a little bit longer to mature than the other distilleries that he's got in his portfolio, the Highland Parks and the and, and the Callans. It must be um, it's quite a portfolio to manage, isn't it? Really. Well, he's very lucky, I think. But he, he, you know, he had a huge amount of experience before with John Ramsey, who was the previous uh, yes. master blender and a wonderful guy. Did you ever come across him? He's a lovely guy. <laughs> he, John I, I, Ramsey. Uh, John Ramsey. Let me tell you just a quick story about John Ramsey. John Ramsey was probably he was a chemist by nature, by by trade, and he joined Edrington Group. And uh, I tried to find out a little bit about his uh, extracurricular activities when he was about to retire, and I wanted just to give him a dinner. And somebody said, "Well, he used to play the hind legs of a donkey." And I said, what do you mean, the hind legs of the donkey? He said, well, at children's pantomimes in Glasgow, he would sometimes, and he's a Burns scholar, actually, uh, but he used to play the hind legs of a donkey. And he got rather bored of doing this. So he filled up a, a squeezy bottle, you know, one of those fairy liquid bottles with water. And as he was hunched in the total darkness and he approached the front row, uh, with little children screaming. He lifted his leg up and he emptied his squeezy bottle on the front row, much to the great delight of everybody else. And this was a man who, you know, he, he was an absolute brilliant star in the world of whiskey. Um, and at a time when we were all developing single malt as a you know, much bigger sector within the category, uh, and a yeah. super, a super man and a great help to me and, and Gordon, likewise. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I did have the pleasure of meeting John on a few occasions at uh, IWSC Judging Week. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Including, we, we were actually inducted in the same year, which I think was... Uh, oh, were well, you? Yeah. Congratulations. 2008 or nine, I can't remember. And and also there was uh, Sam Simmons, who's, who's watching. And it was... Oh, hello, Sam. Well, it was possibly one of the most... Uh, interesting evenings of my life um, in which we got to see John Ramsey possibly wearing something that you wouldn't expect him to be wearing because someone had wound him up about the induction ceremony and told him <laughs> told him that he had to wear a dress. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not saying he did or didn't wear the dress. But no. Have we got any evidence of it? Because it would just be a lovely, lovely thing to put in my my book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, I don't. I, I'm not sure. It, it's possible that uh, photographs exist, but I've already said too much, and I expect the mafia out to get me soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll support uh, you, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Human Shield is not in your middle name, Ronnie. Um, did did anyway, Ronnie just? I see. Thank you, Sam. Did Ronnie just yawn at his own tasting? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sam. Oh, Sam, you're Sam, you're a wonderful well, man. Apparently, Jim McEwen has pictures. Oh, that. has he? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, uh, I look forward to that. <laughs> Stop, Jim. Anyway, Ronnie, uh, I must move on because uh, time. Yeah, thank you. Still for no man, as you know. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to just remove you from the stream. And, but thank you so much for that presentation and chat. It's wonderful. Um, and we'll get you back in a bit. Um, and I'm going to bring in Keith from Ben Romach. Keith, how are you doing? Oh, hold on. I'm just on mute. That's it. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, thank you for, for, for your patience. Um, yeah, thank you. I know yeah. it's uh, frustrating sometimes being at the back end of the tasting, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's well, 
well worth the wait. Um, yeah, fallen Ronnie Cox is the eighth answer. Sorry yeah. about that. No, no, fantastic here, Ronnie. Yeah, really good, really good. Uh, any, anyway, Keith, I, I will not um, use up uh, your valuable time, so I'll let you have a chat with the viewers about the uh, the Ben Romach and the ten year old that you're presenting. Yeah. So, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me to this afternoon. I uh, don't often get a chance to taste so early in the afternoon. Um, I've been at Ben Roma for 22 years, man and boy, when uh, the distillery was reopened. Previously, the distillery was owned by Scottish malt distillers. And then uh, United Distillers, we purchased the distillery from United Distillers in 1993. It was closed, unfortunately, 10 years before that. Uh, Gorn McPhail, they bought the distillery, the Arkett family, they own Gorn McPhail, they bought the distillery in 93 and had the task of refitting the distillery. Ben Romick was an old distillery, but it was never really used for single malt. It was a, a blended malt, space side distillery. Uh, so Gorn McPhail, when they purchased a fast distillery, this is one of the key criteria they looked for was it had to be a space side distillery, it had to be reasonably close to Elgin, which the distillery is, it's in a small market town of Forest. Um, and it, it, they didn't want a brand, they didn't want to buy a brand, they wanted to sort of create and build the brand and produce a very specific style of Speyside. And that's really what Ben Romick is, if everybody says what I mean, what, what is key about Ben Romick, what is different. The main thing, it's a very simple story, when the, when the family, the Arctic family, reopened the distillery, they had a, a blank canvas to, to to sort of pick a style they wanted. So they look back their their liquid history that Gormfield have and they have some of the the rarest whiskey in the world, some of the oldest whiskey from many, many distilleries, not just space side distilleries. But they looked at quite a few different space sides from the the sample catalogue they had from the 1950s and 1960s. And they were these were bottled as, as 10, 12 year old whiskies. And I've seen these samples. Okay, they are old samples. And they wanted to sort of reintroduce that, that style of space side from back then. There wasn't really a space side character back then. There wasn't really single malts back then, to be honest with you. They were bottled as, not until the late 60s really, where single malts took off as single brands and such like. So they looked at the liquid catalogue and, and they, they picked some of the, the classic space sites from back then. The Mortlicks, the Glen Lewitts, the Sothilas, the Linquids, these type of fantastic whiskies. And they looked at the style. And the style was, uh, it was different than the space side nowadays. But I think one of the main things was the, the elegant smokiness. There was just a touch of smoke back then that you that you didn't you don't really get now in, in, in space sites traditionally. So that was one of the key things they decided to introduce that Ben Roma, the core style, um, had that, that delicate smokiness. It's it's lightly peered, you probably twelve ppm, you, which you'll taste in the in the in the spirit, probably about four or five in the, the whiskey itself. But it's a delicate smokiness, elegant smokiness as I call it. And it's just in the background there. So that was a style they chose to reintroduce back in 1998 so they bought it in 93 took a few years to get the distillery up and running and similar to Aaron or Loch Ranza distillery uh, they opened in 95 we have reopened in 1998 although Ben Romack is not a new distillery it was an old distillery just with all the new equipment quite a small distillery uh, similar to Aaron it's we were one of the first I suppose craft distillers you can call them. They used to call them boutique, but I hate that word boutique about distilleries. Craft is more, and there's so much now, but there was very few back then. Um, where the back size was less than two tonne, we we're a tonne and a half, and we're only producing about 400,000 litres of alcohol. Uh, at the moment, we have got room to increase and, and uh, beyond that, but not a lot related to it, quite honest with you. So we uh, we started producing back in 1998, and that's when I came into the, the story of Ben Romick. I have been in the industry for almost 30 years, but I joined Ben Romick uh, in 1998, 
is uh, the still up myself and the manager uh, it was bob murray at the time bob came from glen spade distillery which was owned by j and b at that time uh, bob bob took early retirement and bob decided he was going to come and have an opportunity to start up ben romack with myself so we started in 1998 and we had some fun it was really it, it's a rare opportunity to get to start a distillery from scratch um taking down your first mash was is how i would describe as driving blind you know if you switch your lights off you've got no idea because there's no you have to use your skills because ben roma like a few other distilleries is completely manual the distillery there's no automation in the process so you take your mask down you've got nothing to guide you you just have to use your instinct and your eyes on <laughs> how thick the mask needs to be and everything uh, and obviously temperature needs to be right and such like so that was that was great fun but uh but yeah we've, we we had some great fun bob retired in, in in 2000 and i took over as manager in 2000 so i've been there man and boy and it's 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 rare to get the opportunity to see the 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 whiskies coming through uh ben Omic is 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 made by hand for genuine character as you can see over my other shoulder that one so yeah and it, what i mean by that it is it's traditionally made uh, there's no computers to control the process that's not saying that it's it's any worse product from automation there's no you have to have automated distilleries uh, there's room in the industry for both you know and not every distillery can work handcraft and small it's just impossible the whiskey industry is just too large for that but we speak about the whiskey the way we make it here at ben roma so yeah it's handcrafted we use quite a high proportion of sherry casks uh 70 percent of what we fill is into european fast fill european uh, the character of ben roma can handle that 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 heavy maturation as you call it you can call it aggressive but it's not aggressive in a bad way but ben roma character the new main character is medium to heavy so it can handle it works so well with the the european uh all across the cast the sherry cast that we have so we fill about 70 percent into sherry uh and but one of the main things is the the peating level we have for the core range is a bit like the peat 12 ppm and that just gives that lovely elegant uh character into the the ben romach the whiskey that i'm going to taste with you is our ben romach 10 years old which you see here our new rebranding we've obviously we rebranded this year uh, and we this year last week we actually took out our 21 year old so that's the core style now for me kind of almost complete we've got a 10 year old we have a 15 year old which was the whiskey exchange whiskey of the year 2020 and um, we have a car strength and we have our 21 year old so that's my life work complete now that's me four whiskies and that's it all so yeah it's it, it it's quite it's very rare to get that opportunity and that's me that's basically as my life's work and i've been working in the industry pretty much most of my working life and to have this opportunity is absolutely fantastic so the ben roman 10 year old we took out in 2009 fast age statement from the new production so it was quite a it, it was quite a thing for us this not a big thing in the industry of course there's many 10 year old 12 year old whiskies out there but we decided to uh, bottle it at 10 years 43 percent natural uh, color as you can see um it's got a higher percentage of sherry in it um, and it leans a little bit more to handle the seal than it would be to kentucky to be quite honest with you the if you know the ben roma the first thing you get is that richness coming through you can smell the spices coming through the multi character it's got a lovely cereal note coming through but the spiciness there is absolutely beautiful as well you know it's got cinnamon cloves it's really but it's that that rich full bodiness that comes through is um it's it, it's just so you could nose it all day but this the ben roma 10 year old really characterize 
everything that is Ben Roma, you know, the Sherry cast, the maltiness coming through there, which is very typical, and the spiciness as well. But that perfect level of smokiness that, that you get, which is quite unusual to have that from a space side. But smoky whiskies uh, are not exclusive to the west coast of Scotland, though they do make some fantastic uh, peated whiskies in the west coast of Scotland. Um, we obviously do have a heavily peated whiskey, which we're not going to speak about today. But the ten-year-old for me, yeah, it's my it's my go-to whiskey. It's a whiskey I, I I do like to taste on a on a Saturday evening when I'm relaxing and such. Like you know, as I said, we do have the ten, the fifteen cast strength. The fifteen is a wonderful, wonderful whiskey. You should try that one. Yeah, it's really good. Isn't it? And the twenty-one-year-old, which was released two weeks ago. So yeah, the ten-year-old, it's it's um, it's just everything that that I would say is, is is typical coming from the distillery. It's uh, it is extremely delicious, Keith. Thank you. Um, I must say, I have been to the distillery, uh, albeit mm -hmm. about three or four years ago, I think. And had a very nice tasting afterwards. And I, I remember buying quite a bit of the 10 year old cask strength. I think that was my favorite. Um, has, has anything changed since, since, you know, three, four years ago in terms of the, uh, the eating level? The eating levels like remain the same. You know, um, the standards always 10 to 12. We yeah. do have a heavily peated. Uh, we don't really do the unpeated. The only unpeated we do it would be for the, the organic whiskey that we do, we do small batches of organic whiskey, which is matured in American Belgian oak as well. But the peating level, no, the peating levels remain the same all the way through. And you'll get that character coming through in the 10, 15, cast strength, and also the, the 21 year old. It's straight, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's strange how the peating level changes from year to year. The 10 and the 15 are basically the same makeup of casts, exactly the same makeup of casts. We just leave them longer. And the, the elegant smokiness, I don't think the elegant smokiness fades in the 15. I just think the cask maybe just shouts a little bit louder. Mm. I think the sherry, the fruitness is far more richer than the 15 than it is in the 10 year old. And the smokiness in the 10 year old is just a little bit more vibrant and this is one of the reasons why the 10 year old is is one of my personal favorites is mainly down to the the level of smokiness that it comes through in the palate but no there's nothing nothing really changed okay. the story is getting bigger that's what i'm saying we're building more warehouses and such yeah, like yeah. Uh, for future markets obviously if you want to have bottled spirit you have to look ahead and see what you need so we are um, we've increased production in the last five six years steadily, but we need we need holding stock. And luckily, the distillery is on. It's just on the outer perimeter of the town of Forest, and it's 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 almost rural to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, and we have room to expand slightly with warehouse and space. So. Um, it's good to hear, you know, even even established historical distilleries like Ben Romack are, are, you know, continuing to evolve and expand production because, you know, the popularity of it is obviously on the up and up. So just uh, another uh, example of why it's good to be a whiskey drinker right now and to be working in the whiskey industry indeed. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, I see a lot of lovely enthusiastic young people in this gate because I, I used to be like, young person many years ago. So I'm, I would say I'm probably in the middle there between the young people and no offense, Ronnie. <laughs> um, so I've, I'm kind of, I'm lucky to to have worked with a lot of old old heads or al heads as we call them, which yeah. passed a lot of experience and knowledge, which has been given to me. And then my team are, like, it's quite a young team I've got. Um, and it's passing that on to them because it's, um, Whiskey is very rare that it, it especially distilleries, the, the character comes from, it doesn't come from the people, it's say, but the people contribute 
so much to that. Every story comes from a town. It comes from a small town in Scotland and it has that connection. And it's the people that really give the life to the whole brand. Um, yeah. And I think it's having that, that passion. And it's great because you see everybody, when they speak about it, uh, I think someone said it's as if they've been in the industry all their life for so many years. It's because of that passion. And, and that's one of the things that you do get working at a story. You're very passionate about your people and product. Yeah, as, 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 as it should be, as it should be. Anyway, Keith, listen, that was fascinating. And, and thank you again for uh, joining yeah. us today uh, and providing the Benro Mac 10, which is... Um, just reminded me of how delicious it is. To be honest, I've not had it for a wee while. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to um, remove you from the stream for now. I'll bring you back in at the end. But thanks again, Keith. Thank you. Um, we're going to bring in Gregor. Gregor, are you are you still awake? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I wasn't sure if uh, if Pony had been forgotten about there, but uh, it's good to see that we still have our spot. Oh yeah, don't worry. No, no, no one's forgetting old Paltney in a hurry. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna not waste any time. I'm gonna let you crack on, and then we can have a chat. So there we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Eddie, for introducing me there. Um, my name is Gregor Sterling. I'm one of the international ambassadors at Inverhouse Distillers, um, which uh, it's a term that I guess. Uh, doesn't mean so much, but basically, yeah, I, I travel around uh, much like Mariella, um, educating people on the brand and, and helping with sales and distributors in other countries. Uh, so I've been with Inverhouse Distillers now for about uh, 18 months. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was with uh, another whiskey company and I was uh, actually based in Poland for around three years. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a it's been a, a relatively short, but a, a good, good journey so far. Uh, Obviously, not as much uh, experience in the industry as uh, some of the, the people who, who went prior to me. But um, yeah, it's good to see, uh, like like you said, um, there that you know younger faces coming into the industry like myself and getting the opportunity to to work with great brands and work with products we love. Uh, you know, and travel around the world and and, and show exactly what uh, great spirit Scotland's have got to offer. I, I think it's great. So. Um, I'm obviously very happy uh, where I am uh, at the moment and uh, very happy that we have a strong range uh, to, to work with at Inverhouse. Uh, so for those of you that aren't aware uh, of Inverhouse Distillers, uh, we've of course got Old Pulteney, Bal Player, which you can just see behind me. We've got uh, Nocdu, uh, which makes Anok, uh, Speyburn, uh, just in Rothus, and Balmenich, which is it just passed uh, granted on space. So we've got five distilleries uh, and of course, uh, Karun Gin. Um, so, uh, you know, I work with all the products, uh, but predominantly most of my time is spent uh, with Old Pulteney and Bal Blair, um, traveling across the markets. So, uh, yeah, I guess we should begin because uh, I'm not sure how, how much time everyone has because, uh, yeah, we've been sitting on this for a while and I, I appreciate everyone at home uh, has tuned in for quite a while. So, um, for Old Pulteney, for those of you that aren't familiar with the range or, or with, with the brand, uh, you may perhaps uh, have tried previously the 17 or the 21, uh, which is something that's brought up to me pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, that where did they go and, and why can't people get it anymore? So uh, the brand uh, took a bit of a, a change of direction probably around about, I think it's about two, two years ago. Um, and we have updated the packaging a little bit. The, um, the liquid and the way that it's made has stayed absolutely exactly the same as it was before the, you know the team in the distillery has not changed at all the bottle has stayed the same we've just updated um, the, the label uh, and the packaging so if you're familiar with the 12 um from the previous range that has stayed as it was before as has the 25 uh but we do have the addition of huddards which we're going to try today uh, and there's uh, 15 and 18 uh, and as well some some duty-free expressions so a really strong range and what, what I think they've done really well about the the new range is that there's maybe not so much of a gap between the expressions it's something that's perhaps a bit more um, attainable uh, for all price levels and across markets whereas before if it, if it went from the 12 to the 17 to 21 it's perhaps quite a large jump so now we've got a, you know a price range and, and an age for that everyone could enjoy um, so for those of you that have been uh, up to where the distillery is located, it's uh, located in a, a very small uh, herring, 
herring uh, fishing port town called Wick. Now Wick's in the very far northeastern corner of Scotland. Uh, I'm, I'm in Glasgow at the moment, and it's probably in the region of uh, six to, to seven hours drive, depending on how long you take to get there. It's probably three and a half, four hours to Inverness, and it could be another two and a half to three uh, up to Wick. So um, we are a very... Uh, isolated distillery despite still being on the mainland uh, even i know uh, malcolm our distillery manager often complains when when we send stuff up to him because they're often classed as still like uh, uh, islands it goes down on and the when they have to pay for postage so a, a lot of the processes that you use at the distillery is still dictated by you know ex the location and the fact that they maybe don't have um you know, the same access, this accessibility to, to goods or, or processes that they might have in Central Speyside or, or in the lowlands. Uh, you know, for example, we're, we're still using um, dried yeast. We're not using liquid yeast. We uh, mature all of our stock on site. We don't use centralized warehousing. We're still, you know, a relatively small distillery. Um, it's been in the same location since 1826. Uh, and the distillery all those years ago was actually initially there to provide people, uh, to provide alcohol for the people of the town. So originally it was uh, the fishermen's dram. So uh, Wick um, quickly rise, rose to be one of the uh, world's largest exporters of, of salted herring, perhaps in, in Europe or if not further afield. Um, so in the kind of mid 1800s when it was at its uh, peak, uh, we'd have around 1,100 uh, small uh, ferrying boats or, or ships that would go off uh, into the sea each day to, to, to catch the herring. Uh, people were consuming spirit uh, pretty much um, all times of year, all times of day. So they'd be consuming uh, polynomic spirit. It came in kind of, it was like five litre uh, clay flagons or kind of uh, vessels, which they still have some uh, up at the distillery. Uh, and people would be consuming the alcohol uh, at the time when they were catching the fish, making the nets, um, making casks, filleting, salting the fish and so on. So it actually became a huge issue in the town. They were consuming around uh, 800 gallons of whiskey per week. And if you convert that down to litres and how many people were old enough to drink at the time, uh, equated to around five litres of spirit per person per week. Uh, so, you know, a, a huge demand for the spirit in the town at the time. This was the kind of mid 1800s. Uh, and at that point, the brand or the distillery predominantly was there. It wasn't as an export brand. It was there just uh, as a, a distillery to, to service the people of the town. And it was thanks to the work of uh, Sir William Pulteney. He was the governor of the Fishing Society at the time. And he recognized that the kind of uh, at the end of the, the seven, uh, 1700s that the town really didn't have much in the way of infrastructure uh, that you know there's very rich waters off the coast of Wick have really hadn't really been exploited totally so he commissioned a very famous civil engineer a guy called uh, Thomas Telford um, to create a bit of an inf infrastructure in the town he developed a, a lot of housing just uh, to the south uh, of the the river in Wick uh, and of course, um, expanded the size of the harbour to really cope with that um, increase in demand and increase in the uh, amount of fishermen that were coming into the town at the time. Uh, so the sad thing was, however, that the town that uh, Sir Thomas Telford created died, uh, sorry, that was created uh, was a complete um, before. Uh, after, sorry, Sir William Pulteney died, so um, he, he didn't really have time to see it. Uh, so they, they named the town after him. Um, so today, if you go to Wick and you go to uh, to see the distillery, you'll notice that it is an urban distillery. So the distillery is located right in the centre of Pulteney Town. So that's where we get the name of the distillery. It's named after uh, Pulteney Town and Sir William Pulteney. Um, so today the distillery is relatively unchanged as it, as it was all those years ago. Uh, of course now it's not so much uh, to provide uh, alcohol for the people of the town. Um, it is very much an export brand. Um, and we're probably in the region of around 1.3 to 1.5 million litres in capacity. Uh, we're still using steel washbacks. Uh, we've had steel washbacks at the distillery since I believe around the 1920s. So when they went to replace them in, uh, I think it was 2010, uh, they replaced them with like for like. So uh, everything that we do at Polony Distillery is, you know, the way it has been done uh, all those years ago. The fact that we're still using dried yeast would be much perhaps more efficient or or faster to use uh, liquid yeast, but we don't have that luxury of, um, you know, sending up tankers uh, of, of yeast every other week or every other day. So, you know, to replenish that stock. So we have a, a six week supply of uh, dried yeast on site. Uh, we use um, anchor uh, distiller's yeast. 
Uh, we have a relatively long lag time um, when we are, are starting our fermentation, perhaps a little bit longer than it would be um, with a liquid yeast. Um, we have our two fermentation times, um, shorts during the week, um, around uh, 55 to 60 hours, and then longs over the weekend because we're only um, functioning uh, five days a week. Uh, so it's just uh, between 100 and 110 hours over the weekend. So quite a long fermentation time. Of course, through to our distillation, this is one of the kind of famous things that you know people uh, talk about with Pulney. We, we did our Maltesers quiz earlier on with Lucas, and we, we talked about that smuggler still. So this is, of course, where we get the you know the, the shape of the bottles inspired from our wash still. So we have a really large boil ball and a wash still, a lot of reflux, uh, and actually one of the, the largest capacity stills in Scotland. So a very large, very wide squat still. Uh, and of course, when after that, when we go into condensation, we're still using warm tub condensers. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people watching at home are familiar with the difference between shell and tube and warm tub condensers. But um, with the warm tub condensers we use at Pot, maybe in fact, it's, it's Malcolm, our distillery manager, that always drives home that point. That's where we're going to get a lot of that weight, a lot of that kind of oily, heavy, meaty, sulfury character um, from that. Um, from, from our uh, warm tub condensers. So yeah, from that, uh, I'll, I'll move, of course, through to the dram. So a question coming in, is there a rough age to Hudder? Yes, yeah, so it's a non-age statement. Uh, we're in the region of six to eight years on it. Um, this is a, all of them apart from the 12 are at 46 and are non-chill filtered natural colors. So that's something that we hold really strong. Um, Huddert is a bit of a nod to the Old Pulteney 1990 vintage, if anyone had tried that before. Old Pulteney 1990, um, I believe it was Whiskey Magazine's Whiskey of the Year quite a few years ago now. And when we brought out uh, the new range, we thought, okay, let's work with a cast type that we know works very well with our spirit. So do we go down the road of, you know, um, port casks, IPA casks, rum casks, something that we don't really have any any record uh, of using or do we stick with a cast type that we know works very well so of course we knew that uh, old Pulteney 1990 vintage worked very well and at the time um when it, it was uh, matured in an expeted cask so that's where we get the, the style and um, from Huddert from Huddert uh, is na the name of the street in which the distillery is located so it's named after a gentleman called Joseph Huddert it was a very famous uh, ocean map maker so of course with the herring industry very strongly connected um, but for those of you who do have Hudder at home the first thing I really like to show and, and kind of tell people uh, about Pulteney if you haven't tried it before is it's, it's a relatively heavy oily thick it's quite a substantial style of single malt um, you know I, I've listened with great interest to some of the other presenters you know a lot of their styles they're talking about as being very floral elegant light fruity gentle this this is perhaps not the style that, uh, that, that Pulteney is known for. We're known for that real kind of heavy, weighty style of spirit. And I think that's what, what, what you know keeps drawing people back to Pulteney. Um, they're looking for that something a bit more substantial, something with a really thick, heavy uh, kind of mouthfeel. And I think that's exactly where Huddert stands. So on the nose, the first thing that I get is that weight. It's very dark, creamy, rich, quite fatty. Got some kind of light green apple coming through. And just in the background, a very hint, a very slight hint or quiff of that smokiness coming through. So uh, Huddert, similar to the, the 1990 vintage, is a ex-peated uh, cask matured whiskey. So uh, six to seven years in total. So you're probably in the region of uh, four and a half or maybe around five years second fill ex bourbon and then refilled into ex-peated casks. Ex-peated casks being for one of our other distilleries. So at Balmenich and at um, Noctu, uh, we use uh, peated malt for a proportion of the year. So it's, it's most likely, if anyone's familiar with um, Anok peat heart, that will be an ex-peat heart cask that's matured in. But what that does to it, is, as well as adding just that slight influence of that smokiness in the background, I, I feel it really adds to that weight and that depth of sweetness. So it's very dark, very heavy, rich. I always like to describe it sometimes, it's, it's almost like a, a melted butter quality. It's got that real thick, oily kind of... Uh, creamy note coming through, but also a very slight brininess on the palate, which you'll notice when you taste. The mouthfeel, exceptional, exactly what you'd expect from Pulteney. Definitely getting that slightly maritime or coastal influence coming in. I wouldn't go as far to say uh, that it's salty. This is something that Malcolm and still your manager, uh, one of his kind of pet hates, but a, de a definite brininess on the palate and that will really owe a lot of that flavour uh, to the fact that we are maturing everything on site. Uh, we have a mixture of dunnage and racked warehousing 
uh, and everything that you try uh, from Pulteney is everything's been matured at the distillery. So we have um, capacity for between 22 and a half and 25,000 casks on site and, and everything that you try has been matured at the distillery. Um, you know, I sometimes say to Malcolm, you know, how, sh how should I explain this to people that uh, where do we get this kind of briny or, or maritime quality from? And he, he said, OK, the best way is to show you. So he took me up uh, to, to his office and his office faces out uh, to the sea. Uh, and uh, there was been a very strong storm the week before, or sorry, the night before, and there'd been that kind of lashing of that that sea mist uh, up against his window. They did the, the heating all day, and just on the very bottom of the pane, he lifted it up and he run, ran his finger across, and it was a very, very slight, not much there, very, very slight kind of dry, obviously dry sea salt there. And he said, if you can imagine that's the impact that that sea air has in our cast or, or on the building after just one day, can you imagine what it does to a range? after you know six or seven years with this or up to 15 18 or 25 years so that breathing in of that that clean fresh sea air is something that we really uh you know stand by and definitely feel adds a lot to to the style and the character and the dna um of pulteney but if, if anyone uh hasn't uh, taken a trip up it, it's the most amazing backdrop uh if you go up to of course, this North Coast 500, the way that things are going with um, staycations and, and people staying in Scotland to holiday, if, uh, drive up past Balblair at Etherton, across the Dorne at Firth, and then you go up through Golfsby, and then all the way up uh, to Wick. It's, it's just the most amazing backdrop. It's really rugged. It's, it's really exposed. Uh, and Malcolm always says, he says, uh, you know, Wick, it's not at the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from it. And I think that really uh, shows you everything you need to know about Wick, that it's, it's, it's really right on the edge. That, I feel anyway when you got there, it feels like you're on the edge of the world. So it's it's a really cool place to, to stay with, uh, you know, bags of really rich interest in history. So it's pretty much all from me. Um, I, I don't have as many industry really? stories uh, from from the past twenty years. I'm afraid about Eddie uh, being quite young, uh, but <laughs> you know, I could talk about the distillery um, uh, all day. You know, it, it's it's a fantastic <laughs> range we've got just now. Other for people that are perhaps looking for something that's slightly smoky but not peated maybe that's something i, I should talk about that is it's an ex-peated cask the peated malt which we use is still unpeated we're using a sassy um malted barley we get it from simpsons and inverness and you know in terms of um the the phenol content spec for the malt is, is less than 0 0.5 so unpeated malt but um pulteney spirit matures in a peated cask and that's where other sits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Th Gregor, thanks very much for fitting so much. Yeah, I don't want to take too much time from the next presenter. I know how it is to, uh, to be almost at the end. So, uh, I, I, yeah, so th thank you for, yeah, for listening. Yeah, yeah. No, no, and thank you for coming on again. And, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna, to, there aren't any further questions at the moment from the uh, viewers. So I'm going to move on to, to David and the, the sure. Gary. So thanks, Gregor. Brilliant, thanks we'll a lot. Back. Thank you. Uh, let's get David in. David. Yeah. Oh, hold on. You're muted. There we oh, go. Me. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Um, now, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, how are you doing? Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Um, it is a reasonable day down here where I am. Um, and I've got a... You know, you say no pressure, so I'm not going to have any pressure on me because I'm going to let the whiskey do the talking around here, is my cunning plan. That sounds so, like, like a good plan. Um, and I think, I, do, do we give you the credit for selecting this from the range or for asking for it? Or did uh, did we sort of suggest it towards you? Because I, um, I think it was Mike um, who suggested it. So I think it's Mike McKenzie you need to thank. Well, I think he's done us all a, all a bit of a favour here because um, this is a rather glorious uh, dram that we have in our glasses. Um, this is from the Glengarry Distillery. Um, I think most distilleries like to make a claim about they are the most something, the uh, they're the oldest this or the you know, most obscure that. Um, uh, Glengarry's little claim um, is it's the most easterly distillery in Scotland. Um, I don't really think that makes any difference to anything in all honesty but that is one of our little claims um we're not um an independent we are small we are in the center of the village of old meldrum um so we are very much part of our local community 
Um, there are only two stills in the distillery. We do not produce a huge amount of whiskey. Um, and we are part of um, Beam Suntory. So all those um, wonderful Japanese whiskies, uh, Hibiki, Yamazaki, Hakushu, Lafroig, Bomo, Ochentoshin, uh, let alone the bourbons, the Maker's Mark and all the Jim Beams. Um, so Glengarry is sometimes the, you know, slightly overlooked. We're um, a bit of a, you know, I don't want to say forgotten about, but you know we are we're small scale compared to a lot of the other whiskies that are being produced. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that we are just on the verge of a bit of a, a renaissance at the distillery, and things are going to get um, interesting going forward. And there's a lot of um, plans which are really quite exciting. Um, we're actually closed at the moment. We're having a bit of a distillery uh, refurbishment. And one of the outcomes of this is going to be that we're going to have our own floor maltings back again for the first time in many, many years. So you know, this is a, an indication, if you like, that um, Beam Suntory are um, investing quite a lot into Glengarry and are very interested in what we're producing um, and very interested in continuing to produce some very interesting and different whiskies and establishing that little extra element of uh, of control over every part of the whiskey making process here. And what this refurb and the floor maltings, um, but one of the other things that it means is coming back to Glengarry and Glengarry for some people is it's famous for something more than whiskey in fact for some people it's um what else it's famous for is more important than the whiskey and that's um that's tomatoes and aubergines and cucumbers um in the 1970s uh we were one of the earlier distilleries to really start to um look at what we were doing with the heat and trying to recycle, particularly the 70s, you know, costs went up and up and up. And so the engineers at what was then Morrison Bowmore, the owners, um, came up with this cunning plan. Um, and this cunning plan um, involved recycling as much heat as possible, but also providing, um, using the heat for a kind of fundamentally for um, you know, a big market garden attached to the distillery. And we had over an acre of greenhouses and over an, another acre of polytunnels. So we were, um, we were growing more vegetables. You know, we are where the distillery is located is sometimes referred to as the larder of uh, Aberdeenshire. And um, we were very much part of that. Now this happened up until about 1993, we stopped then. Um, but with this refurb, it looks like we are going to go back into the market garden business. So, you know, really, I just wanted to talk to you all about whiskey, but um, I felt it would be remiss not to mention um, what is going on there um, on the, like, the other side of the business. Um, so the whiskey. So Glengarry has produced a lot of different styles of whiskey over the years. Um, up until 1995, we were producing peated whiskey. Uh, the distillery was uh, mothball for a couple of years then, 95 to 97, and then when it reopened, we were uh, concentrating on an unpeated uh, new make, an unpeated spirit. We have experimented every now and then, and so in um, 2004, I think it was, um, we uh, ran a, a, some peated barley through the still through the system, so there are still some peated uh, Glengarry's available. You don't have to go to a pre ninety five um, bottling distillation to get them anymore. But for the most part, what we produce is an unpeated whiskey, and we are a small distillery, so we have two core expressions. We have a 12 year old, we have a founder's reserve. Everything that we produce is uh, bottled at 48% ABV or higher. So we too will wave the flag here for the joys of um, non-chill filtration. Um, but we also then will have a continually changing range of um, different expressions uh, that come out 
Generally speaking, these tend to be vintages that we release. So, and although nearly all of the vintages will um, also have the year of bottling, so there is an age statement on them, um, we do know and refer back to the year of uh, it goes into the cask as well. So the whiskey that we've got in our glasses, this is one of two um, live vintages from 1999 that the distillery has issued. The first was bottled back in, so just checking my notes here, back in 2013. So the first was a 14 year old and was very much um, a sherry cask um, a bottling, burned, very much matured in sherry casks. Um, this one in our glasses now, this is slightly unusual, slightly different. Um, it has been matured in red wine casks, um, full maturation in red wine casks, and that has been for 19 years. So that is a lot of uh, European oak influence coming through. Um, one of the advantages of being part of a company such as Beam Suntory, um, Beam Suntory own Chateau Lagrange in Bordeaux. So that is where these uh, wine casks come from. So if you do get your nose into the glass here, you know, this is uh, glorious, you know, summery red berry fruits. It's got a softness to it. You know, 19 years in oak, you expect a fair bit of chewiness maybe, but this is just... You know, it's a, just a great warm hug of a whiskey. Um, it's a little cuddle and a caress of a whiskey is what I'm beginning to feel about this. Um, so, it's mm. pretty delicious, isn't it? You definitely get a sense of the, uh, the red. I, I really think you do. I think it race. really pays off. It gives a real point of difference. I mean, Certainly for me, I mean, a lot of wood spice happening there as well. Um, my tongue is, uh, oh, but that's good. Um, and yeah, I mean, I know I'm kind of contractually obliged to say how good this liquid is, but I think that's really rather <laughs> special. Um, and it just, it's another, it demonstrates that you know, because we are quite small, you know, we can play around when um, Quamelli, who's our uh, distillery manager up there, you know, we've got these quite an interesting variety of casks. So he just puts them aside and lets them mature away. So, you know, next year's uh, vintage that will never, you know, will be different. Probably won't be a red wine cask again. Maybe we'll go back to the bourbon barrels. Maybe, you know, we have done a virgin oak bottling as well. So we do like to, you know, we're small, we're traditional, but there's a lot of experimentation. There's a sense of adventure about what's happening with Glengarry at the moment that I think is reflected in the whiskey and does make it a real pleasure. Yeah, yeah. And certainly very exciting to hear about the uh, floor maltings being reinstigated. I'm sure. Yeah, I know. That is uh, definitely a trip to Aberdeen. Is Up to Aberdeenshire is going to be uh, worthwhile <laughs> in the near future. And do you, do you know when that is, um, when that's going to be complete, David? Um, the, you uh, said, checking his notes carefully, um, it looks like the distillery is going to be um, reopening just by the end of the year, so late November, early December. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's when the floor maltings will be in operation, but we will be um, spirit will be running again by then. Is the plan? Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Well, th listen, thank you for, for for rushing through that. Sorry, perhaps didn't have a, a, as much time for for each whiskey. Um, we were going to do a Q and A um, following this session, but I think we're we're, we're pretty much out of time. So, oh, what I want to do though is get everyone back in, and because oh, I removed myself there, that was very professional. <laughs> um, um, guys and gals, uh, listen, thank you so much for uh, being part of this. I really, really appreciate you giving up your time as well as your whiskey um for this session i hope you guys have enjoyed it i uh, hope obviously everyone at home has enjoyed it in their safe surroundings uh it's been a really marvelous tasting lovely whiskies lovely people uh, so thank you once again um but uh, we're gonna have to call it a day so thank you guys slan jabbar everyone slan jabbar thank you so much thank you.
and we'll uh, we'll all meet again soon. I hope. I look forward to that. <laughs> Enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you in the next session, which starts in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.